Hey guys, how's it going? In this video we're going to start looking at stellar physics and specifically we're going to look at properties of stars. So let's get started. So it says here that stellar physics is the study of stars throughout their birth, life cycle and death. It aims to understand the processes which determine a star's ultimate fate, i.e. what's going to happen to a star. Astronomers classify stars according to their mass, luminosity and colour, and in this part of the course we will explore the properties, processes and life cycle of the major stellar classes. So firstly, as we said, we're going to start looking at properties of stars. So the first property is surface temperature, and it says that when viewing the night sky, it is apparent that stars are not a uniform white colour. The surface temperature of a star determines the colour it appears. The cooler the star, the redder it will appear, and the hotter the star, the more blue it will appear. And this goes against the normal way of thinking because you're probably used to associating red things as being hot and blue things as being cold. But for stars, it's the other way around. So if stars are redder, then they are cooler, and if stars are more blue, then they are hotter. And next we have the modern stellar classification of stars. So all of the stars of a certain colour have been given a spectral type. So we've got spectral types of O, B, A, F, G, K and M, and those have certain temperature ranges. So for example, stars greater than 30,000 Kelvin have the colour blue, and an example is the Orion's Belt stars. And you'll notice that as the temperature range gets lower and lower, then the colour goes from blue towards red. So we go from a blue to a blue-white, then to a white, then to a yellow-white, then to a yellow, then an orange and a red. And you'll see the example for the yellow one is our sun at a temperature between 5000 to 6000 Kelvin. And that's because the surface temperature of the sun is around 5800 Kelvin. Now I should point out you don't have to remember these spectral types and their certain temperature ranges, but it is a good idea to remember that blue stars are hotter and red stars are cooler. However, if you do want to remember it, the order of the spectral classes has been remembered by generations of astronomy students using the mnemonic, oh be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. It then goes on to say the Stefan Boltzmann law gives the total energy being emitted at all wavelengths by a black body. And the black body is something you saw at higher level. We've then got our definition of the black body and it says that a black body is a body that absorbs all the electromagnetic radiation instant on it and also emits all wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. So it absorbs and emits all EM radiation. Something else which you would have seen at higher level in the ODU topic is that the emission follows a typical curve, the emission of wavelengths, i.e. radiation known as a black body curve, and this is our black body curve here. And just to help you visualise this, I'm going to show you a quick animation. So here we have our intensity of the radiation against wavelength, and right now we're at a temperature of 3700 Kelvin, so our star is pretty cool and it's going to look red. If we then increase the temperature, you'll notice that we go through orange to yellow to blue. So the first thing to notice is that when we start off low and go to a higher and higher temperature, you'll notice that the area under the curve gets larger, and that means that more radiation is being emitted by the star per unit area. So as we go from low to higher temperatures of stars, they emit more radiation. And what we should also see is the peak of the curve moving towards the left. So you see the peak moving further and further to the left, and what that means is that the wavelength of the peak gets shorter and shorter for higher temperatures. And we can actually associate values with this wavelength using Wien's displacement law. So if we go to higher and higher temperatures, you notice this value here of the peak wavelength is getting smaller and smaller. So going back to the notes now and looking at our picture again, we've got our power output on the y-axis or intensity of the star against wavelength on the x-axis. And so the first curve it shows is for a cooler star, which is lower down, i.e. smaller area under the graph. And then you'll see that for a hot star, we've got a larger area under the graph and the peak has been shifted towards the lower end of the wavelength spectrum, which is what it says here. So the hot star emits more radiation, but its peak is shifted towards shorter wavelengths. So from this, we can conclude two things. So it says two important results can be taken from the graph above. The peak moves towards shorter wavelengths with increasing temperature, and the increase in radiation, i.e. the area under the curve, rises steeply with the temperature since, by Stefan Boltzmann's law, the power per unit area varies with the fourth power of the temperature, i.e. P over A is directly proportional to T to the power of 4. And this relationship here leads us to an equation. So this is an equation you get on the relationship sheet in the exam, and it's for the power per unit area emitted by a black body. So we say the power per unit area, which you could give the symbol P divided by A if you want to make it a bit shorter, is equal to sigma T to the 4, where power per unit area is measured in watts per square metre, sigma Stefan Boltzmann's constant measured in watts per metre squared per Kelvin to the 4, and that constant value you'll find on the data sheet, 
and T is the surface temperature of the star measured in Kelvin. The next property is mass, and it says here that the mass of stars varies. Red dwarfs are the least massive, less than half a solar mass, where a solar mass is the equivalent of the mass of the Sun. The most massive stars are blue giants, some as large as 150 solar masses and giving off 4 million times as much energy as the Sun. Our Sun has a mass of around 2.0 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, or roughly 330,000 times that of the Earth, and you'll get this value as well on the data sheet in the exam. Other stars range in size from roughly 0.08 solar masses to about 150 solar masses. The most numerous stars have low masses, with only a relatively few high mass stars in existence, so that just means we have more lower mass stars than we do higher mass stars. No stars with masses outside this range have been found. The mass of a star determines its lifetime and therefore its overall fate. We'll see this later when we talk about the evolution of stars. Moving on we have the radius and it says that the radius of a star is hard to measure directly but can be found from its luminosity, which we'll see next. It then says our sun has a radius, our sun, of approximately 696,000 kilometres, about 109 times that of the Earth. White dwarfs, which are small dense stars nearing the end of their lives, again we'll see that later, may have a radius of around 0.01 times the radius of the sun, whilst at the other extreme, supergiants may typically be about 500 times the radius of the sun. So now we're going to look at luminosity, which is a pretty important property of stars, and it says that the luminosity of a star is a measure of how bright it actually is, i.e. the total power it emits, not how bright it appears to us on Earth, because that is to do with the apparent brightness, which we'll see shortly. It then says that its luminosity is dependent on its radius and surface temperature, and we just saw that luminosity can be used to find the radius of a star. So we have this equation, which is L equals 4 pi r squared times sigma t to the 4, where L is the luminosity of the star it measured in watts, so it's almost like a power in that sense. R is the radius of the star measured in meters. Sigma is Stefan Boltzmann's constant measured in watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the 4, and T is the surface temperature of the star measured in Kelvin. So just remember luminosity is how bright a star actually is, not how it appears to us on Earth. The last property to look at is apparent brightness, and again this is an important one, and it says that the apparent brightness of a star is a measure of how bright it appears on Earth. So this is not a measure of how bright the star actually is, that was the luminosity, this is just giving us an indication of what it appears to look like to us. It then says that this is dependent on its luminosity and its distance from the Earth. And remember things like the Earth's atmosphere will be in the way between us as observers on Earth and the star itself. So the Earth's atmosphere is something that can distort light and therefore affect the apparent brightness of stars. And the equation is that b equals l over 4 pi d squared, where lowercase b is the apparent brightness measured in watts per square meter. Remember at higher level we looked at irradiance, which also had the units of watts per square meter, so these are similar things. L is the luminosity of the star measured in watts, and D is the distance between the observer and the star measured in meters. Now it's also worth pointing out here the inverse square relationship between the apparent brightness and the distance between the observer and the star. So if we ignore the luminosity and the 4 pi for now, we have this B is proportional to 1 over D squared inverse square relationship. And just to help put this into context, I'm going to show you a few pictures here. Just ignoring all of this text, but looking at this little picture here, let's say we were measuring the apparent brightness at a distance of 1 AU away from the Sun, so that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Our area right now is 1 unit, but if we extend the distance to 2 AU, i.e. 2 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, then our area becomes 4 units, so we've got this L over 4 pi times 4. And so that factor of 4 in the bottom comes because we're now doing 2 squared from the 2 AU. And if we then increase the distance again to 3 AU, that becomes an area of 9 units, i.e. dividing by 9 on the denominator this time because of the 3 squared. And lastly, 4 AU would mean 16 on the denominator because of the 4 squared from the inverse square law. So what this really means is that as the distance between the observer and the star increases, the apparent brightness will rapidly decrease. And the brightness will drop off rapidly because of the inverse square relationship. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.